paid member, they've got the paper already. Um, people who are on our list serve, but not members, they don't have the paper. So for instance, if a bunch of graduate students would show up, because you know we advertised there, and I know at least one said thanks, I forwarded on to my students, et cetera, in Chicago. Um, you know, then they wouldn't have the paper. So it, it I suspect okay. the three of us have the paper. Okay, very right. good. Yeah. Sounds good. So always better questions than I have answers. No, I that's good. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I knew that not, not everyone had the paper. So I just, uh, I feel bad for those who have read the paper if then hear, hear it again. But I mean, that's just, right. uh, I guess that's well, the, name of the beast, so. If, if it makes you feel better, Josh, I haven't read it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I do feel better actually, ironically. I think I feel worse about that, but I feel better. Thank you, that's good to know. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> I just didn't have time to get to it, that's all. I know, I mean, I'm so busy, I gotta say. Uh, I, you know, I, I thought that by working very hard as an undergrad and a grad student, I'd become a prof uh, professor and have sort of an easy life, you know, and no, <laughs> it just gets more and more, more hey, of a work. So. The real world, Josh. Yeah, I know, I know, right? Who knew? I'm like more stressed now than in grad school, but anyhow. George, you, you always look to be in a different spot every time I see you. Ah, uh, well, I certainly am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I certainly am in a different spot today. I'm in my living room because I'm exiled from my office, uh, and uh, that's because somehow or other, if you hear strange noises in the background, carpet is being installed down there. Somebody's up on the roof over my head, working on the chimney in the fireplace. Uh, <laughs> so all kinds of things are going on. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can unmute Adrian here. Perhaps. You don't do that work yourself. Big pardon? You don't do that work yourself? New roof, new floors? Uh, yes, <laughs> although I've been prohibited from, by spouse from, from singing. She uh, thinks I'm losing my sense of balance and uh, will no longer be reliable on the roof. I think that's false, but um, can't, can't argue. So I was it is dangerous though. I uh, have a friend who had a friend who was a roofer and he died falling off a roof, you know? So, I mean, he did it for a living. So I guess the chances are higher over, over time, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's not a joke to fall off a roof. Right. No, it's not. <laughs> and we've had that similar, not, not a death, but a career and pretty much career ending and life changing accident on the part of her doctor, who we liked very much. Um, Anyway, yeah yeah yep so so i i'm retired i can afford to um share my retirement modest retirement stipend with people who could use the money and the time to do all this stuff and that's the new um that's the new reality <laughs> yeah it can be very satisfying to do work yourself but it does take time and often you have to learn a new yeah, a new set of skills, right? And I mean that, that can be enjoyable too. But uh, if you don't, you know, install a roof every every week, then yeah, when you go to do it, you have to then watch a lot of YouTube videos and talk to your friends who do that um, for a living. So anyhow, but it can be reward. It can be rewarding though to have a. Uh, then when you walk on the floor, you know, you know that you're the one that installed it. So what? What's YouTube? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> YouTube is really handy. It's uh, it's really changed all these things. I gotta say, you know, if you want. So like for car work, I mean, uh, you know, I, will, uh, you know, it's, it, it turns out it's very easy to actually to replace a light bulb in a car. You know, if you can find, you can, you can YouTube your, the, the car model and they'll just walk you right through it and you can save a lot of money that way. I knew a guy who fell off a roof and lived, but completely changed it. As he tells it, changed his personality. He says he was a terrible human being before and then after the fall. A huh. good one. And so wow. maybe I should get hit in the head a few times. I <laughs> yeah, I suppose we could all use all of that. <laughs> like Phineas Gage, right? The classic uh, right, example. Right. He, uh, his personality totally changed afterwards. Yep. Yes, yes, with his rebar and the Yeah, the yeah. yeah. I got a few rebars out here that I have <laughs> <laughs> my wife keeps them on hand. <laughs> That must be a regional thing, George. We call them re-rods out here. 
Re really? The concrete reinforcing rods? Yeah, I've, I've heard both, you know, words, yeah. but and they mean the same huh. thing. That's like, it, right? yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. So by my clock, it's 10.01. Right. Uh, so I think, you know, it doesn't mean other people won't trickle in. Uh, but I, I think probably this will be, you know, at least close to the people we'll have. Um, so before we begin, you know, I simply want to say, uh, as I typically do, that this is being recorded. Um, if that and it will be posted on the MSA YouTube site. I do know that we have one uh, later. So if that's an issue for anyone, um, you know, then, then now would be the, the point of no return. Uh, but otherwise, we're very happy to have Joshua Tepley and uh, the paper he has for us on the avatar. And I'll turn it over to him. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Tyler. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Sarah Glenn, who I see is here uh, for inviting me and putting me in touch with David Weissman. And thanks to David Weissman uh, for reading the paper and then doing the referee process. And Tyler, thanks for setting this up. You know, I appreciate it very much. Uh, so yeah, this is a paper, uh, it's a longer paper. I can't read the whole thing today. It's around 10,000 words and it's for this volume, the Palgrave Handbook of Popular Culture as Philosophy uh, with editor uh, David Kyle Johnson. And I believe a co-editor now, uh, Christopher Lay as well. So it's a, it's a longer paper that'll be published in the next year or so. And I'm gonna uh, summarize some parts and read some parts and hopefully I'm done in 30 minutes for uh, plenty of time for Q&A. So the, the paper is on Avatar, <laughs> James Cameron's Avatar from 2009. It's a great movie. I do recommend it if you haven't seen it. I enjoyed it very, very much. And I believe there's an Avatar 2 coming out uh, sometime soon. And so we'll see if anything and that movie sort of uh, upends what I argue in the paper. Uh, but, so we'll see about that. But um, I do want to summarize the plot very, very quickly. I hope that you've all seen the movie. If not, I'll, I'll give you some key details. And then I'm going to discuss um, a scene in the movie, the final scene, where, I mean, spoiler alert, but this is the, what it's about. Um, the main character, Jake Sully, actually switches bodies with his avatar. So it's, a, it's, it's a, an alien-human hybrid that looks like the alien, and uh, he actually ends up in the alien body. And I remember watching the movie and thinking that's not possible. Like just given what I know of metaphysics, that's not, that's not possible. But I've been thinking about it more and there, there is a way in which I think a person could switch bodies. And so that's the main task today is to argue how that's possible uh, in a way that's compatible with what happens in the movie. So very quickly, the movie uh, came out in 2009 and uh, in 3D, I hope you saw it in 3D in theater. Uh, that was a, 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 a treat. It takes place on a moon in the future named Pandora. And Pandora is filled with all kinds of exotic animals and plants. And uh, one important feature of the planet uh, are this alien species called the Navi. And they are about three times the size of normal human beings. And they breathe a different kind of atmosphere that's poisonous to human beings. So the humans are there and they're trying to mine an element um, called unobtainium. And the aliens are causing them trouble. So the humans then develop a technology to, so they can communicate with the aliens and perhaps solve the, the conflict they have. And it's an avatar technology, which involves uh, plugging into a kind of machine that will then scan uh, your brain patterns and then link you to this human Navi hybrid, which is the size of the Navi alien and breathes the local atmosphere and so on. And basically there's a linking technology which syncs your brain to the avatar brain. So while you're plugged in to the machine, it seems like you're in the alien body or the hybrid body, okay. Uh, the main character of the movie is Jake Sully. Uh, he's paraplegic and he arrives to the, to the moon and uh, he is uh, given an avatar because his brother, his twin brother um, was a scientist on the, on the moon and he died. And the uh, avatars that you operate has to be linked to your own DNA. And so Jake Sully has the right DNA. So he gets plugged into the avatar and has a bunch of adventures on this planet meeting with the local Navi uh, population. Uh, one thing he learns from the Navi is they worship a deity named Ewa, and that deity will come in, into, into play in my uh, paper. And Ewa is, well, as I understand the movie, she's actually a physical creature. She's, she's not actually a spiritual deity, I don't think. She's actually uh, physically located or realized in this massive root structure under the planet, uh, planet surface. So as I read the movie, 
Awa actually is sort of a, a, a tree root structure, which uh, seems like it has certain uh, functional uh, correlates with, with, human, with, with brain structures, with neurons. And so she's realized in this root structure. And uh, at the very end of the movie, she helps facilitate this body transfer. So at the very end, there's this final scene where there's this sort of this tree where it, you know Awa's roots are, are, are connected. And Jake, um, the roots in the tree sort of go up into Jake's uh, body, and they also go up into his avatar body. And at the end, it's very clear he's the avatar. Somehow, then through this root structure seeping into their nervous systems, she facilitates the transfer. Okay. So the question is then, does this make any sense metaphysically? So could you actually achieve this kind of transfer between, you know, where you take a person who moves from one body uh, to another? In the paper, I spend some time talking about persons, what they are, bodies, what they are, how they're related. And the key here is trying to give a, an account of the thesis that persons can switch bodies that's neutral with respect to different theories, right? So it's not assuming substance dualism or kind of materialism. And so I do that in the paper. I, I'll skip over that. Uh, I also spend some time talking about identity because uh, the thesis that we can switch bodies relies on a notion of, of identity. And I, you know, cl clarify, you know, it's numerical identity as opposed to qualitative, for example. And I also have a section on possibility. So when I say that the movie seems to suggest that it's possible for a human being to switch bodies, um, what kind of possibility do I have in mind here? And it's metaphysical possibility. So basically, it's, it's, it's conceptually coherent that a person could be in one body and then at some later time in a different body, or it's the same person but numerically distinct bodies. Okay. So that's just sort of background. And the paper, then I go on to talk about ways in which this uh, won't work, because you might think, well, I, mean, I think it's obvious that we can switch bodies. I mean, after all, the if, if, if possibly just means what's conceptually coherent, then doesn't the fact that we can watch the movie and make sense of what's happening at the end of the movie, doesn't that show that it is possible? And I want to first, before I give my own solution to how it is possible, explain why it's not clear that it's possible. So in the paper, I talk about animalism to start. So animalism is the view that we're just animals. So human beings are just animals, biological creatures. And for example, if that theory of human persons is true, then body switching is just, is just impossible. I mean, so just how we, the way we define it, a person cannot, if um, switching bodies means it's the same person, but a different body, if we are bodies, then you can't switch bodies sort of by definition, okay? Um, another possibly is substance dualism as a solution. So you sort of swap souls and that actually would be a solution. That's a way of swapping, swapping bodies. But I do place this constraint on the paper that, what, uh, that it has to be consistent with what happens in the movie. And as I watch the movie and interpret the movie, there are no souls in the movie. So the Navi ha have a sort of a rich spiritual life, but the way I understand it, Awa is a material creature that consists of this root structure and the aliens are just material things too. And so that's not how it happens, I think, in the movie. Another possibility, obviously, is just to transfer pers a person's brain. So this, I think, would work. So, you know, we, we remove my brain from my head, your brain from your head, we swap the brains. I think that would be a way where we could actually switch bodies. Uh, so that's a possibility. The key is that that's not how it happens in the movie. In this final scene, uh, Awa does not actually remove Jake's brain and his avatar's brain and swap them. That doesn't happen. Finally, a, a fourth sort of dead end is just rewiring a person's brain to have the same structure as the person's brain you're trying to transfer them from. And this is the well-known problem of duplication. So imagine that you know we have Jake here and his avatar here. And we sort of we sort of copy over Jake's brain patterns onto his avatar's brain. Uh, avatar's brain, um, yeah, his avatar presumably would think and act just like Jake, but wouldn't actually be Jake, because after all, Jake is still there, presumably, right? And so uh, you can't then transfer bodies by simply having a sort of a duplicate of you um, that has the same brain structure. So those are four four ways it wouldn't work, I think. So I want to jump into how I think it could work. And um, this then, the, the first step is understanding how human beings relate to their avatars uh, in the movie. And so there are two major possibilities here. One is that avatars are just tools 
used by human operators. So they're more or less just like a, like a remote control drone. So if I have a remote control drone, um, I may you know, uh, have control over the drone, but I'm not the drone, it's just a tool that I have. So one possibility is that avatars are just, are just tools, um, end of story. But that's not the only way of understanding how they relate. Um, you could think that in fact, while a human being operates an avatar, they literally extend into the avatar. So on this view, um, an operator like Jake Sully is not numerically identical to, the, to uh, his avatar, but is a complex whole with two major over, non-overlapping parts, the human body, which is in a lab, let's say, and the Na'vi uh, hybrid body in like the jungle or the forest. So on this view, um, you know, when, when Jake's not plugged into the machine, he's body size, when he plugs in, he extends literally into um, his avatar body. He's a complex thing with two major parts, uh, animal part, sorry, a human part and a, uh, well, human Na'vi hybrid um, part. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, but here's a question. Does that second view where a human being operator actually literally extends into their avatar, does that make any sense metaphysically? Is there a theory that can account for that? And I think there is actually, and it's called constitutionalism uh, or the constitution view. So this view goes back to Aristotle um, and is defended more recently by Lynn, Lynn Ruder Baker um, among others. And the idea here is that human beings are not identical to their bodies they're rather under normal cases, they're constituted by their bodies. So on this view, we stand to our bodies more or less the way that a statue stands to a lump of clay, okay? And this view allows for persons to be partly constituted by things that are not biological. So on this view, if I got, let's say a fake knee, um, then perhaps, you know, I am then a, a person which is constituted by my biological body and then my fake knee, which is of course made of like plastic or metal, right? So um, this view opens up that possibility. Um, so then the relevance of this metaphysical view to the idea that we can extend beyond our bodies into our avatars is this, if this view is true, then um, what, what constitutes a person at any given time is not just a body, but whatever functions in the right way. So a person could then, I think, be constituted by a human body and an avatar body together. So if you hold the constitution view, you might think, well, when Jake's plugged into his uh, avatar, he actually is a human person constituted by two things, a human body and a hybrid naive, naive, uh, na sorry, Navi, Navi body, excuse me. Um, in the same way that a cybernetic person could, would be constituted by both a biological organism and a mechanical parts. So that's the idea, okay. So I think that the constitution view provides the sort of a framework to explain how a human operator could actually literally extend into their, um, their avatar and be a whole thing with, with these two, two parts. But thus far, I haven't given any reason to think that it actually would, this would actually happen, that this actually makes any sense. Um, sorry, it makes sense, but is there an argument for, for, for this uh, conclusion? And I think that there, I can give an argument of, of sorts and it consists in four connected thought experiments to get you um, to the conclusion that actually Jake, when he's plugged in, is actually uh, constituted by both his human body and his uh, Navi body as well. So let's forget all about avatars just for a moment here. And uh, here's the first thought experiment. Suppose scientists remove your brain from your skull and keep it alive in a vat of nutrients, but also maintain its connection to your body through a long, bundle of nerves sheathed in some strong and flexible material. If the bundle carries signals fast enough, there should be no noticeable difference in your experience, except for there's a tube at the back of your, your skull, basically, and your head might feel a little bit lighter. So would the fact that your brain is not inside your body imply your body is not part of you? And I guess I'm inclined to say, no, I think that the physical location of your brain doesn't matter what matters is that it's tied into your, um, your spinal cord in the right way. So you remove your brain from your head, as long as it's, it's causally connected to your uh, spinal cord in the right way, and you can't tell the difference, I would think, well, why can't then I extend beyond my brain and this set of nutrients to this biological body? So that's the first thought experiment. Here's a second one. Suppose a scientist replace 
the long and flexible cord with radio transmitters that fit the ends of the nerves leading out of your brain and those, those leading into your body. If the technology were good enough, your experience should be indistinguishable from the one where you're attached to the body uh, via this, this, this cord. This one's a little bit trickier, but I mean, so here's the question. In the situation where your brain is operating your body remotely, um, is it a situation where your body is actually part of you? And here I'm not sure, but I guess I, I wanna argue just for sake of argument that it would be. I mean, why should it matter that you're, um, you're literally hardwired into your body via a bundle of nerves? I mean, shouldn't standing in the right causal connection um, be sufficient, okay? So why I think it has to be actually physically attached via a hard wire, as long as it's doing the same, the right causal work, why couldn't um, I literally extend into my body via these radio transmitters. All right, if you're with me so far, then here's a third thought experiment. Scientists do the same procedure described above to a, another person and then switch the transmitters so that your brain is synced with their body and yours is synced with your own body. So here's the question is what happens? Do you now have a body over which a different person has control or have you effectively switched bodies so that the other person's body is now literally a part of you along with your brain? And I wanna argue for this paper that it's the latter, that what makes your body part of you is not its DNA or its history, but rather the causal connection it stands with your brain. So if your brain uh, were synced with a body different from your own, the one that you were born with, then I think that body would now become part of you. Okay, finally, fourth uh, thought experiment. Suppose scientists put your brain back in your body and connect you to a sophisticated device that can read the parts of your brain responsible for controlling your body and activate the parts of your brain uh, in charge of receiving signals from your body. This device links remotely with another body, which has a brain specially designed for this purpose. While the device is in operation, the normal inputs from your body are replaced by the inputs from the other body, and the normal outputs from your brain are relayed to that body. As a result, when the device is in operation, you cease to be aware of your own body and seem to, seem to be in the other one. And so the question is, what then is the relationship that you bear to this other body while it's in operation? And I think if you've, uh, gone along with the previous three thought experiments, then the answer is actually um, this new body is now part of you, okay? And of course, that's then what's happening in Avatar, right? So in Avatar, what the last scenario I described is just what's happening in Avatar with the only difference that the uh, body you're operating remotely is in fact sort of this Navi human hybrid as opposed to just a human body. But I don't see how that should make a difference. Now, I mean, I'm not willing to say that actually these are all knockdown arguments. I mean, I'm not saying that. But they are suggestive, I think. And I think that if you wanted to argue somehow that um, Jake Sully does extend into his, into his avatar body while he's plugged in, a kind of series of thought experiments that take these kinds of steps um, are the best way of getting there. So let's take stock. Um, we've got a theoretical framework for understanding how a person could extend beyond uh, her body into an avatar. That's the constitution view of uh, like Lynn Ruder Baker. And we've got an argument, this sort of series of thought experiments, which uh, show that this would be the case if the technology in the movie were actually real. But none of this yet addresses the primary metaphysical thesis that I'm talking about in the paper, namely that persons can switch bodies. Showing that you can extend beyond your body and into another body is not the same as switching bodies, okay? To get from the one to the other, more is needed. Um, so here's the question. How does the possibility of extending beyond one's body lead to the possibility of switching bodies? And the answer is this. If people can extend from one body into another body, then presumably they can also shrink from two bodies to one body. If the body into which you shrink is the one you started with, then there's no change. But if you shrink into the other body, then you've switched bodies. Okay, so on. So this is the this is the core idea of the paper. The idea is that look, you're a human being 
you're not identical to your body, you're constituted by it. Perhaps there's some sort of a causal connection you can extend into a second body. So now you are a complex thing with two parts, a body here and a body here. Um, if somehow this can be separated from you and you can shrink into one body, and it's this body, you've now swapped bodies. That's the idea. Now you might think that the job is done, that I, I've, I've uh, you know, shown how uh, you can switch bodies, but it's actually not that simple <laughs> because um, how do you make sure that once you've extended it into a second body, that when you shrink, you shrink into the, the new body, not the original body. And it's pretty clear that at least in the movie, simply killing the human body isn't gonna do it. So in the movie, when a person extends into their avatar, if you kill the human being, you don't end up in your avatar, you just, you just die, okay? So once you've extended into a, an avatar body, how do you shrink down then to being just the avatar body? And that's actually you. So that's the second piece of the, uh, the paper, and that's um, more challenging. And I think, um, just to be clear, I mean, this is maybe, I don't wanna go into this too deeply, but I think it's very clear that just simply copying brain patterns is not gonna work. So if I'm, here's Jake Sully, here's his avatar, um, and they're, 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 you know, um, there's one person there that sort of uh, overlaps with, with, with both parts. It's not enough to then copy the brain of this person, this, this brain over here. Uh, that won't do it. I can explain that later on, but um, I have to move on to explain um, how it will work. And the solution is gonna involve um, a very brief detour through uh, a subject I think that we most, I hope we most know about, namely split, split brain phenomena. So the brain, as we know, has two halves or hemispheres that are connected by um, and synchronized by uh, some nerves called the corpus uh, callosum. And when this is severed, either accidentally or intentionally, the two hemispheres demonstrate some surprising independence of each other. And uh, you, know, you, you can Google this and watch videos of this and it's fascinating. And it's a real phenomenon that's been documented extensively. So, um, Humans that have a severed corpus callosum show evidence of at least potentially having two independent streams of consciousness, one in each brain hemisphere. So that's sort of the first uh, fact. Another fact is that because these two hemispheres can operate somewhat independently of each other, a person actually can survive with just one hemisphere. Um, and this has been documented. Um, I think that you might have to be below a certain age uh, in, in sort of the real world, but there are children who've had one brain hemisphere removed who then go on to live normal um, normal lives. And so for all you know, I may only have one brain hemisphere. Now, the point of introducing that is to, is to, um, is to show first how a person could switch brain hemispheres and then use it as a model for how you could switch brains. And that will then be the last piece to explaining how Jake Sully can actually uh, switch bodies with his avatar. So um, how could a person switch brain hemispheres? Suppose it's a person um, who has just one brain hemisphere. So the left one, let's say, and let's ignore about how that happened. They just have one hemisphere, okay? Suppose further, this person has extraordinary regenerative capabilities, which allow her to regrow her right hemisphere in a way that by the end of the process, this fully formed hemisphere is perfectly synchronized with her left hemisphere in the same way that the two hemispheres of a person with an intact corpus callosum uh, are synchronized. So if done properly, then there's no time at which her new right hemisphere functions independently of her left hemisphere, of her left hemisphere. In other words, there are never two streams of consciousness. So you have a person with a one, only one hemisphere, they, re, they grow a right hemisphere. If it's done in the right way, they're perfectly synchronized and there's never a time when you have that sort of two independent streams of consciousness. Now, imagine this person's left hemisphere is slowly destroyed and in a way where while it's functioning, it's never out of sync with the other hemisphere. In other words, um, you never actually allow the two hemispheres to have their own independent streams of consciousness. So, you know, there are different ways of doing that. What you shouldn't do is just like cut the corpus callosum and then destroy the one hemisphere. It's gotta happen in a way where again, there's always synchronization and never two independent streams. I think it's done properly. At the end of the procedure, a person has switched hemispheres of their brain. So you can imagine a person, they have one, just a left hemisphere, they grow a right hemisphere, they're synchronized the whole time, and then the, the left one's destroyed slowly, and then all you're left with is the right hemisphere. 
And I think that would be a case where a person does actually switch hemispheres. Okay. So applied then uh, to brains, basically you just do the same procedure, but with brains. So, um, um, sorry. Um, yeah, so you, you sync up two fully functioning autonomous uh, brains, or sorry, you sync up a fully functioning autonomous brain with two hemispheres to a separate brain, which is initially non-autonomous, um, but in a way where there's never two independent streams of consciousness. So in the movie Avatar, Awa does this, I think in this final scene, okay? So the idea is that then you have uh, Jake's brain and Awa slowly brings into synchronization his avatar's brain in a way where um, it, the, the new brain, a second brain rather, never has his own independent stream of consciousness. So that they're linked in a way. So Awa is actually playing the role of the corpus callosum. And then in the same way with the, the brain hemisphere case, Awa makes it the case that then the original brain, Jake's brain, actually is slowly uh, decommissioned or destroyed. And again, in a way where it never actually has its own independent stream of consciousness. And I think then if you did all that, Jake would have switched bodies. So putting them all together, this is how a person could switch bodies in a way that's compatible, what happened to the movie Avatar. The person extends from one body into another by standing in the right causal connection to it. So via this technology in the movie. Then the person's brain extends into the other brain by slowly syncing with it in the same way that two brain hemispheres are uh, synced in our own brains. And A was the one that will facilitate that in the movie. Finally, the person's original brain is slowly destroyed um, and if it's not done properly, there's never a time at which then each brain has its own independent stream of consciousness. And I think if that were to happen, then a person would actually switch bodies. So I apologize that that, that, that was too much in 30 minutes, but that, that's the model, okay? So you have to then hold a view that we're, we're not our bodies, we're constituted by them. You have to allow that we can extend them beyond our bodies uh, with say another body, so long as you're seeing the right causal connection to it. And then you have to then have this funny thing with your brain where your brain then syncs with the other brain in a way where there are never two independent streams. Um, and, rough, and the procedure is roughly then the same as, uh, well, does what the corpus callosum does in us. And if you do all that in the right way, I think you could actually, actually switch bodies. So that's the paper. Um, I hope it was comprehensible and I would love some feedback. There's still time uh, before it's published. So if you have any, uh, major objections or thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Josh, this is George. Um, yeah. The, there are several things this brought to mind. I'm not a big fan fan of of this particular kind of discourse, but I see how really intriguing it is to illustrate our longstanding conversations about uh, mind, body, brain, body, uh, personal identity, and so forth. And you've beautifully done that. Thank you. Uh, as they apparently have a movie, I haven't seen the movie. Um, I'm gonna if I was time, I'll mention something else that, that uh, in a humorous sense, that does take this same, up the same question for children um, in a way that I find intriguing, having a lot of grandchildren that, uh, anyway, let me get to the main thing though, and this is a very serious conversation that you have, um, have illuminated, I think, uh, in your paper, whether intentionally or not, about the metaverse metaverse, I think, uh, the, the hypothetical discussion amongst uh, the cyber folks um, about the sense in which one's avatar plur or avatars, plural, uh, might become them uh, and our lives in a community would be in a digital uh, community and would uh, actually involve the identification of our essential self with these uh, projected uh, virtual selves. And that, that 
virtual community might even come to replace our physical one. I'm not sure how far this all goes, but certainly there are advocates and there are persons who are afraid of it and thinking this is exactly what Facebook is doing to us. And you know, So it's a constant theme of discussion, I'm sure you're aware. And I just wonder if you reflect on your own thought experiments for the um, plausibility of the concerns raised by the coming metaverse. Yeah. Oh, George, that's a great question. That's very thoughtful. Thank you. Um, I hadn't thought of that connection at all. And I just have maybe, maybe two or three thoughts. One is that, I mean, I don't quite know enough about computers to know what you're extending yourself into. So, I mean, um, would you be extending into, say, like bits of, of computer programming or bits of software or you know, uh, zeros and ones at a hard drive somewhere. So that's the question is like, what is this other thing? This, this, uh, this app, we'll say, you know, this uh, virtual avatar, what kind of ontological thing is that, that I could then extend into it? So that's just a, a, a great puzzle. And I don't know, actually, I don't, I don't, I've not thought enough, enough about software objects to know how that would work. So that's so a great question. I guess I don't know the answer. The other thought is that um, at the end of the paper, I did actually try to bring this back to the real world by showing how my solution for how to switch bodies solves a problem for the transhumanists who want to like upload their minds into computers. It's very clear that even if you could functionally duplicate uh, a human brain with a with a digital computer, um, simply you know duplicating your brain wouldn't actually turn you a new computer because you can make then 10 copies of yourself and you wouldn't be all 10. And so um, there's this problem where even if we could replicate a human brain in a computer, how we ever upload ourselves. And I think that uh, the solution I outlined would allow for that. So if somehow we could connect up a human brain to a, bit of, uh, to a hard drive in the right way where they're synchronized and they can't have their own independent streams of consciousness, then you could actually perhaps extend into a hard drive. And then if you have your biological body destroyed, you'd be in the hard drive. So there is that application, but I'm thinking in terms of hard drives, not in terms of a software avatar. So uh, it's a great question, I guess. So read one way, I don't know how to answer it. And the other way I think, yeah, if it's just a hard drive, I think it would work actually, as long as you could duplicate the functions of a, of a human brain you know, on a hard drive. Does I'm that help sure. or do you have, what do you think? I'm not sure the multiple copies problem um, is a fatal objection to this idea of personal identity and the digital world in as much as we know um, one of the intriguing things about human consciousness is that persons are in fact not necessarily unified. I mean, seriously ununified, they're suffering from we, we, we say they're suffering from mental illness, but they're overcome by, you know, multiple personalities or voices in the head and all this, all of which are associated with things uh, like um, severing the connection between the two hemispheres and a variety of other, you know, the rebar and the, or sorry, re, what was <laughs> it? Um, re, re, uh, rod, re rod <laughs> in the brain. Uh, <laughs> um, the physical, uh, damage to the the a person's brain can create or enhance what are already properties of con human consciousness, which is only relatively unified, um, you know, with different personalities and so forth. So you could have, in principle, it seems to me, a, an avatar for each of your favorite 10 selves. You know, your compassionate self, your heroic self, your angry self, your bank robbing self, whatever. Um, and people do stuff like that. In fact, I think I was looking at a Dateline NBC last night where that was actually the MO of the murderer. He had several different personalities on Facebook, one of which was homicidal Hank. And <laughs> that was a that and his identity with Charles Mason kind of gave him away as a plausible um, suspect in a murder, an actual murder. Uh, but he seemed like such a nice guy. 
and everybody, including the friend that he murdered, uh, thought he was a nice guy. So, um, yeah, I think we'd need to even dive deeper than you have into the way in which the activity of a that we identify with a physical brain you know, embodied can lead to a variety of personalities, all of which are part of the self, any of which could be reproduced or copied either into separate selves or into an identical self with 10 parts or whatever it would be. So, you know, even though I find this highly implausible, all this kind of discussion, there's enough going on, it seems to me, in the, not just the digital world, but in terms of abnormal psychology and so forth, that uh, even when it's enhanced by, by digital technology like uh, uh, Facebook, that um, these kinds of things in the spirit of your original paper deserve careful investigation. Yeah, that's great, George. That's very thoughtful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, it's true that I'm assuming a kind of traditional view of persons that there, you know, there are persons and, you know, uh, you can count them and numerical identity applies to them. So I, I am assuming that you're absolutely right. I guess I would say that's not so bad. And uh, cases like DID, I don't think are proofs that that model is incoherent. They're just puzzles that have to be solved. So um, again, I, I think you're right that I make a number of assumptions and we can question those. I agree hundred percent. I don't think it's as obvious as maybe you do that somehow they're, they're they're bad assumptions, you know? So they are assumptions, you're right, but I think they're actually, they're defensible. Um, but yeah, you're right that I didn't defend them in the paper for sure. And certainly you can question them. Yeah, so that's great, yeah. Other feedback, thoughts, things to improve? I, I, maybe I'll make a point of, of that, George, that, you know, that well, I think I do the paper, I'm making certain assumptions, so, but I can make that more clear, so. Yeah, Robert, please, good to see you again. You're muted, Robert. And you're still muted, I think. There we go. Oh, all right. Okay, okay. It's George's now, fault. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned uh, in, in your story here uh, about uh, history. Uh, you've uh, treated the person uh, just in terms of uh, pretty much contemporary aspects of life. But uh, after uh, he's become the body of the uh, Navi, uh, does he still have his memories as a, a broken body? And does that go back through his college years to his brother's life and so forth? I can't imagine it'd be very easy for him to understand what uh, those things. Yeah, I mean, great question. So one thing to be clear is that this, the last scene of the movie is Jake and his avatar underneath the tree and something's going on there. It's pretty clear that there's this procedure going on. And the last thing you see are then, well, you see Jake die because then uh, his love interest removes the mask and he's poisonous to human beings, so he dies. And then the avatar opens its eyes and then the movie stops. So it's very, I mean, I think re it's not a, a leap to say he's now in his avatar's body, but we never actually see what it's like from his point of view. Um, presumably in the next movie we will. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I could probably put money on he would have his memories, I think. I think it's pretty clear that... Um, I don't know, because I'm, I'm assuming this here, but somehow his avatar is going to act like he acted when he was when Jake was connected to him. Um, and in that case, the memories were actually contained in, in Jake's brain. But I assume then they'll be now in his in his in his avatar's brain. So I think the answer is yes. Although I mean, I got to say for myself, I'm not so keen on um, sort of psychological continuity theories of identity, and because you can have these kinds of problem of duplication, so. Um, which I think are very bad. Maybe then we could argue about that. But I think that if I can duplicate my personality into, into five other individuals, I can't be all five. And so that's somehow not enough. So the answer is yes. I think he, is, he does carry on his personality, but I'm not convinced that's actually the case that that's actually necessary. Um, like I'm inclined to say that if you have, a, if you have a, a, a stroke and you lose all your memories or you have sort of deep amnesia, you're still the same person. I'm inclined to say, 
because you go where your brain goes. But that's controversial, of course. So does that help or not? I mean, what do you think, Robert? I mean, do you think, uh, what do you think about that? Well, I wonder what it would be like uh, to uh, uh, be a Navi, uh, but also to remember what it was like back on human Earth and so forth. Yeah. It would be. Well, I think during the movie, we get, we get a, a sense of that because for most of the movie, he's as if he's in his, in his avatar body, you know, he's running around in the jungle and, you know, he thinks he's Jake Sully and he has these memories. So I think it's the same thing. It's just that then at the end, what's doing the, the thinking and so on is not then the human brain in a lab, but now his Navi human hybrid brain. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other questions or thoughts, feedback? <laughs> hey, okay, I uh, see. George, let us Very unmute. Very funny. Thank you. <laughs> uh. Okay, Josh, thank you for all these possibilities. Uh, during your paper, I was thinking of that ancient problem of the ship of Theseus, which gets its parts replaced gradually, and then after all the parts are replaced, you wonder, well, is this the same ship or is this a different ship? Um, if I should lose a limb and get a prosthesis, I wouldn't regard that as part of my body. I would see that as a tool that happens to be attached to my body. Uh, if on the other hand, I should get an organ transplant from a human donor, I would regard that new kidney as part of my body. But if I get a new mitral valve from a pig, I don't know, I mean, it was a pig, not a human. Is that, is that part of my body or is that a tool or an, an addition? Um, these are all very gray areas to me, and I was wondering where you would draw the line on them. Eric, that's that's great. I love that question. That's very very good. Um, yeah, I mean, so I guess one thing I should say is that the you know the paper, I'm not sure I agree <laughs> with the argument. I'm making the best case I can that the movie is not just incoherent. So that's the first thing to say is that I'm not convinced. I'm not sure we can switch bodies. I guess I think I would say I'm sure that if we can without involving souls or removing our brains, uh, then this is how it would have to happen. I'll say that, okay? As far as the prostheses, yeah, this is a good question. There are people who think, no, we, I'm essentially organic. So if I get inorganic parts, they're not part of me. They're just, you know, I'm just a little bit smaller and I have this thing attached to me, it's not part of me. Um, the, on that debate, I gotta say, I'm actually inclined to say that it's causal integration and not, biological integration that matters. So I would think, I, I actually am inclined to say that if I have a, a prosthesis, let's say arm plugged into my, into my nervous system, like the way that uh, Luke does in Star Wars, I guess I'm inclined to say it actually is part of me, you know? I'm not gonna like, you know, uh, bet money on that, but I'm inclined to say it is part of me. It's more, it's, it's more uh, is it linked in, yeah, is it uh, linked causally in the right way, not biologically? Um, as far as Theseus, I think, yeah, it's a great puzzle. And I mean, I'm inclined to say that if you, let's say we name the ships, the original ship and the continuous ship and the uh, reconstructed ship, I'm inclined to say the ship go is with the continuous ship, you know, as long as the um, there's the right kind of space and temporal, temporal continuity and causal continuity is the same ship. So that is a puzzle, but I think that I would say, yeah, you can change all your parts over time. And I'm inclined to say I can become non-biological um, because yeah, if you replace parts of my brain with silicon chips that do what brains do, you know, and they help me think, I would think, yeah, that's part of me. And eventually you do it enough and I'm just a, a mechanical man. Um, so, but yeah, but, but, your, but your view that we're bi essentially biological is not, um, it's also very plausible. I'm, I'm not sure, frankly. So uh, I guess I'm inclined to say we can become non-biological, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a slight inclination. But it's a great question. And the weird thing with this um, uh, example from the, the movie is that there's not, there's not even space, spatio-temporal continuity with Jake and his avatar. There's a big spatial gap there. And so it's gotta then be this causal connection like, that, that does it. Um, so yeah, that is, that, that's puzzling, yeah. Other thoughts, feedback, follow up, Eric or Robert or George? 
quickly, uh, Eric, unmute. You can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I I can only ask you. There you go. I guess Kiki I can has a only question. Ask too. People oh. to unmute. I can't unmute them myself. I have, however, made Tyler co-host to see if he can do it. Kiki, do you I have a question? I can unmute now. Yes. Oh. Uh, so originally, when I would try to unmute, it would say that the host has not permitted this or or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Eric was and I turned that me. off as soon as we started, so I don't know what all the trouble is. Okay. Um, but. Yes. Uh, Anyway, I'm going to mute myself because I've got all my <laughs> okay. So I think Kiki had a hand up. Is that right? <laughs> um, oh, it worked. Yes, it worked. Now, <laughs> like it kept going back and forth between being able to unmute and not being able to unmute. Um, thank you. That was really interesting. And actually, my question was sort of the same as Eric's. Um, basically, like on this Constitution view, like so, what would be the criteria for something? being able to be a part of me, um, which I guess then causal integration um, is your answer to yeah, that. Yeah, no, good. That's a great question. And to be clear, the view itself is neutral. I think that Lynn Ritter, Ritter Baker, for example, I think that she does consider this. I think she might think that it has to be biological. So I guess I'm not sure what she thinks. I mean, yeah, I'm trying to then, the view that I espouse in the paper is a view where it's causal integration. So you actually could then um, be comprised in part by, or constituted in part by, by you know, uh, a plastic bee, for example. But that's um, that's not essential to the theory. So the theory just says that um, you know human beings are not identical to their bodies; they're constituted by them. But it's it's open then what would count as a body here? So is it essentially biological, or could it include non-biological components? So um, it, yeah. I mean, I think animalism, for example, would not allow for that. I think if you're an animal, is then I think well. I'm inclined to say then we are essentially biological and if you get a fake knee you're just a little bit smaller um and have some plastic like i have a sort of a four not you know a, what, do you, what do they call it uh well it's just a foreign object lodged in your in your leg you know um but i think that the constitution view it does allow for the possibility of being constituted by a combination of biological and non-biological things yeah i and, mean i guess oh um, I, I'm not but, sure then if causal integration is, is uh, if there's questions about that too, right? Like what, what counts as causal integration? Yeah, of course. I guess maybe functional integration is a better word because I mean, I mean, I causally interact with my environment too, you know, and if I'm wearing a glove, I mean, that's, I'm caught, you know, that has, that has certain kinds of causal connections to me as well. So um, yeah, this is a hard question. I mean, you can imagine, yeah, hard cases where I'm at, um, um, you know, I, I've got some something, uh, a breathe, a, you know, I'm on a, a, the moon and I've got a respirator on and if I take it off, I'll die, right? Well, then is that now a part of me because somehow it's keeping me alive? Um, I, it's a hard question. So yeah, there's a lot of work. I have one more what, small what question. Yeah, please. Which is, so on this view, I don't think I really understand uh, what we are then. So we're not, we're not our bodies, but we're also not our souls. So then what are we? Yeah, uh, um, that's a great question. I think then we're going to be persons and persons are defined by having certain kinds of, uh, you know, features like a uh, thing that can be rational and use language and so on. And that thing can then be constituted by a variety of things, a body or perhaps a, a machine or a combination of the two. And so, yeah, we're not defined in terms of the material stuff that we're made of. It's kind of like, a, I guess, like a functional view, right? Where, I mean, if you're a functionalist, you define the brain or the mind rather, not in terms of like the, the biological components, but it's what, what it does. So we are things that do what persons do, we think. We can use reason, we have, a, we have a moral sense, maybe we have free will, for example. And yeah, that can be then constituted by various physical things like machines or bodies. Um, does that help or not? So we're not animals on this view, we're not souls, we're not brains, we're some other kind of thing that is constantly. Yeah, I just so. wonder sort of like then what that would be and if that would include like whatever your criteria are for being a person, if that would actually pick out the right things we wanted to pick out, including like infants and not pick out maybe certain other things. Like, I don't know if we want to exclude animals from being persons. And so what oh, are those yeah. criteria right. so that they pick out the right things? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, good. that seems like a big yeah. question. No, that's right. <laughs> that's a good, it's a great question. And that's a hard question. Uh, yeah. So then our infants persons and yeah, our dolphins persons. Yeah. And uh, that, to me, it seems like that's a separate issue. Um, and so it's a good question, but I'm not sure how, if I have to then determine that before I can then determine this. I mean, so. Um, Suppose I'm, yeah, um, how can I put this? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's a separate question, right? It's like asking what properties are. I mean, yeah, I guess my theory involves a theory of properties, but that's like for a, a separate issue, I think. But is that not, not is that not help? Maybe. Um... And yeah, so I mean, so of course that's another big question. Um, it's just, I guess, if we, if you move it from saying like we are a body or a soul or like something else to this, I mean, then you're solving your problem, but you've created another big question about then what that thing is. So, so, and you can then say that's not, that's a different question. Yeah. Um, right. But you're sort of solving one problem and there's another sort of other problem. In the yeah, that's true. Back end. On the other hand, I mean, suppose that I'm an animalist. So I think that I'm just an animal, right? Well, then I'm committed to the view that I was a fetus. And if you remove my frontal lobe, actually if you remove most of my brain and my body is still respirating and so on, that's still me. Um, so am I still a person? I mean, I guess, so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure you solve the problem by then, or let's say I'm a soul. So then are souls all, you know, uh, could God take away my faculty for free will? from my soul and my capacity for reason from my soul and so on. So I'm just like a, just a soul. Well then how is that still me? So you're right that there's a, there's a question there about what makes a person a person. I'm not sure that then defining me as an ontological category, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a an animal or a soul is gonna, it'll have its own problems, I think. It's a great question though. Can, can and, you I... know, there, yeah, please go ahead. I want to pick up on something that you, you said when responding to Kiki, which is, you know, so what, whatever person is, I mean, that may be an open question, but it's, you said at one point, um, well, I'm, I'm not a soul or I'm not a body or I'm not a soul and a body, but I'm a person that then may or may not have um, a soul or a body or a soul and a body. So one, um, are you saying that a person is not a person because it has a soul and a body, but if someone's a person, then they might have a soul and a body or a soul or a body and, and, and they're functional. And if that's true, then would, it, would you also be saying that um, something like, I don't reason and think because I have a soul, but I'm ensouled because I reason and think and I'm not located in space. Uh, or I don't have a body, therefore I'm located in space, but I'm a spatial being, therefore I'm an incarnate being. Would you sort of be reversing the, the hmm. order of the terms? Yeah, that's also, that's great. I guess, um, so the view, I'm not sure I actually am a constitutionalist, but the, the view that I'm sort of using to then explain how we could switch bodies to the paper is this view called constitutionalism. And in that view, we're not our bodies, but we do stand in a very special relationship to our bodies, namely we're constituted by them. And that's the same relationship that holds between a statue and a lump of clay. And so, um, yeah, so it is the case that I'm not my body, but I do stand in a very close connection to it. Unless I have, um, you know, uh, bionic parts, for example, uh, I am constituted by it. And the soul, I think, doesn't come into play here at all. I mean, so Avatar, there are no souls in Avatar, as far as I can tell. And me, just me personally, I don't believe in souls. Uh, so... I don't know how could this view be combined with souls? I mean, I guess going back to Aristotle, who is in some ways a kind of proto-constitutionalist, for Aristotle, there are souls, but they're not substances, right? It's going to be the form of the body. And so, yeah, I guess I'm willing to allow souls in that sense. Somehow it's a, it's a, it's a property of the body, kind of structural property uh, of a body. But I don't, I don't think that substance dualism fits nicely with the constitution view at all. Um, yeah, and it is puzzling. I mean, so, but I mean, a you know, a statue and a lump of clay is also puzzling. So you have the lump of clay, it's not a statue, you form it into a statue, and the lump of clay is still there, but there's this new thing there, a statue, right? And so, 
yeah, they're really closely related. They've got all the same parts. And if you, if you, uh, they weigh, they weigh the same and they have the same shape for a while and so on. So they're very, very similar. Um, but still they're different because in fact, I could then squash the statue and the lump would still be there, but the statue would be gone. And actually one, I mean, one reason why you might be a constitutionalist about human beings is that you might think that my body did come into being when it was a fetus or let's say a zygote, right? Or, or pretty soon thereafter. But that wasn't me because it lacked a brain with the right kind of complexity to have mental states, let's say. So in that case, then I can't be my body because that body existed on day five. I didn't exist until say whatever, you know, day, day 65 or something. So that said, I must stand in some very close connection to it. And uh, the constitutionalist says that's the, the, the relation of constitution. So that uh, I stand to my body the way, again, a statue stands to a lump of clay. So, I mean, it's weird. It's weird that now there are two things here, right? There's my body and that's one thing that began to exist day five after conception. And there's me, <laughs> which is, has the same parts. Um, and that thing began to exist about 60 days later. So that, that's puzzling, um, but makes just the way it is. Does that help Tyler or not? Or does that just make things more muddy for you? Um, yes and yes. Uh, I mean, um, I, I guess may, maybe I would want to say, you know, so you're insisting on that I am to my body as a statue is to a lump of clay. But if a yeah. person is also a thing that thinks and reasons, uh, why can't we say that my, my, my soul is to my thinking the way the statue is to a lump of clay? Why then would you want to say, as you did in answering, well, I, I, not for souls, but yes, for bodies? Yeah, good. I mean, because the idea is that the, the constitution relation is usually between things that have the same, are made of the same matter. Um, but exist at different times. So um, usually it's sort of a material relationship between things that share, share parts. And I'm not sure that, I mean, souls don't have parts, I don't think. So I think it's just a, talking about immaterial souls is, is just a different beast. I'm not sure how a, a soul could be constituted by anything because it doesn't have any parts. So that's the main difference, I think. Are there other questions, comments? Concerns. <laughs> if there are not, then uh, we're at an hour anyway, which, which you know, uh, I, I think we sometimes spill over, but that was the original plan. So uh, I hope that you all think, uh, help me in thanking Joshua for the, Joshua Tepley for the great paper and the good Q&A. And- uh, coming. Look forward to emails from me in the future about when our next one will be. Uh, things are quasi up in the air for, for various reasons, but I'll try to get those things hammered out as expediently as I can. So thank you. Very good. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Joshua, Tyler. Be well. Nice to see everybody. Take care. You too.